As the Detroit Lions get set to do battle against the Carolina Panthers this Sunday in Ford Field, the Lions are coming into the game with a literal bevy of offensive weaponry that I don't think that the Carolina Panthers defense is going to be able to handle. In today's film study, we're going to be looking at a past game that the Panthers have had as to what could be the secret for the Lions' success. Stay tuned, everybody. It's about to get fun. It started with an owner who had a last name fans despised. Hiring a coach that the experts thought was crazy. But I got a plan, I swear to you. Who traded for a QB that was said to be washed up. They said the Detroit Lions would never amount to anything. That it would always be the same old Lions. But this team, our team, has a new identity. Defined and expressed by the crazy head coach. Doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes, I will beat your ass led by the QB that nobody thought was good. Motor City Mania is in full swing and ready to start. So join the show and be prepared for kneecap biting because Motor City Mania starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. I'm your host, David T. Pike, and we're diving in right now. As always, to those that are returning to the show, I just want to thank you all for your view, your patronage, and your support, and thank you all for coming back. And for the new timers, the newcomers to the show, again, thank you all for tuning into the show, but also welcome in. Hopefully you guys hopefully you guys can decide to subscribe, and hopefully you guys keep coming back as well. But with both of y'all, I just want to say God bless, and let's dive into today's show. Now, here's the thing, folks. I've talked about this before. The Lions offense is coming into this game with a literal just treasure trove of weapons because there is no shortage of weapons that the Lions can use to their advantage in, the, in this game that's upcoming on Sunday. Again, we're going to have Amon Ross St. Brown. We're going to have Jay, We're going to have Josh Reynolds. We're going to have Khalif Raymond. We're going to have Sam LaPorter. We're going to have David Montgomery. We're going to have Jameer Gibbs. And we're also finally getting back Jamison Williams. I mean, come on now, folks. It's not that hard to believe when you think about just how freaking crazy it is to have Jamison Williams back and how much of an effective weapon, even if he's not being utilized, it's going to be for this Lions offense. Just absolutely crazy. And I've talked about it in a previous episode. I'll put that episode link back up at the top. But when you think about it, the reason why I'm talking about this game for the Lions in this sense is because I want to show you guys a very uh, a game that happened two weeks ago for the Carolina Panthers. This game was against the Seattle Seahawks. Now, why am I talking about the Seattle Seahawks when it's a Lions versus Panthers game that's coming up? Here's the reason why. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you think about it, one of the teams in the NFL right now that's very, very similar in terms of what their offense does, in terms of what their team is, and how their team is doing things right now, is the Seattle Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks are very, very similar to the Lions in how they, one, like to run the ball to set up the pass. Number two, how they have been a team that a lot of a lot of other teams and a lot of other people in the NFL didn't think was going to do so well so quickly, but they are, especially after trading away their long-term starter and getting a new guy in the backfield. So there's a lot of similarities between the Lions and the, and the Seahawks. And if you think about it from that perspective, the way that the Lions offense runs is also very similar to how the Seahawks runs. I'm not saying that they run the same formations, but it's very similar in the style and the content of what they do. So I was like, okay, here, let's go back to that game of the Seahawks versus the Panthers to kind of get an idea of what we can expect from this Lions offensive attack that we're about to see here. Now, why am I doing this? Well, here's the thing. When you take a look at these film clips that I'm about to show y'all, you're going to get a very, very clear idea of what I think the Lions are about to do here. I've talked about it in a previous episode. The Panthers' defense, while it's okay in the sense that it's a subpar defense, it's still not the best defense that could possibly be out there. And again, the Lions have already gone against much better defenses in terms of, one, the Chiefs' defense. Even though it was missing Chris Jones, the, 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 the Chiefs' defense has already proven to be one of the better defenses out there. And again, the Lions have been able to play themselves very, very well regardless of who's on the field opposite of them. Well, I can tell you this right now. The Panthers' defense, again, not much of a challenge, but they do have some decent pieces on there. One, they do have Brian Burns. He's always a linebacker you've got to be aware of because he's going to bring pressure and he's going to get sacks. It's just going to happen. And even though he's old as dirt, they've got Justin Houston, who is still an effective rush, uh, pass rushing threat as well. 
But when we're talking about the defensive backfield, it's a completely different story. The Panthers are already dealing with a bevy of injuries in the defensive backfield. And on top of that, their best cornerback is already on IR. So it's like, okay here. The Lions definitely have opportunities to run the ball on the freaking Panthers because their rush defense is not that good. But also, they have the opportunity to throw the ball. Now, why am I saying this? Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because the Panthers' pass defense in terms of passing yards actually looks like that it's really good. But one of the things that I found out earlier this week is that the teams that the Panthers have gone against don't really like throwing the ball all that much, save the last two. And that's the thing. The first two games that the Seahawks, not the Seahawks, the first two games that the Panthers played against was one, the Panthers, or sorry, sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself, the Falcons and the Saints. Both of those teams don't throw the ball very well. The Seahawks actually was the one game where they got a lot of passing yards thrown on them, which is like, hmm, okay, let's take a look at that game, seeing as how the Seahawks are very similar to the Lions. So let's take a look at what the Seahawks did in that game. Here's this very first play I want to show you guys. This is a 12 formation. I'm trying to set up the description of what we're about to see here. It's a 12 formation, two wide receivers, two tight ends, one running back. This is going to be a play action pass. So here's what's going to happen as the play runs through. Geno Smith brings Tyler Lockett in motion from left to right. When the ball is snapped, you're going to see the whole offensive line shifts to the left as the tight end that's on the left side comes to the back side, and that's no offense to give extra protection for Geno Smith. What then happens is that Geno Smith does a play action uh, motion to, to Zach Charbonnet, the running back. Now, I want to show you guys this. Take a look at this still frame here now that, the, now, that the, um, now that the play's had about a few chances to run through. Look at this huge freaking hole in the zone defense of the Panthers. Like, dude, there is literally nobody around DK Metcalf, who's the receiver here, for like a good, what, five, seven yards? Like, this is easy throw and catch right here. Geno Smith doesn't even have to really think about this one too hard because DK Metcalf has no one around him. It's a huge freaking zone hole, zone gap. All Geno Smith has to do is put the ball in literally Metcalf's general vicinity, and it's a completion, which is exactly what happens. It's a huge gain of 20 yards on the play right there just from a simple play action concept, and the Panthers' defense is no where to be found. So that's the first play I wanted to show y'all. And again, think about it this way, folks. This is off of play action. The Lions offense is one of the best in the NFL in terms of play action production because, hmm, consider the quarterback we have, Jared Goff, who's one of, and in my opinion, as I've stated before, the best play action passer in the NFL. Again, he was number one last year. He's ranked number seventh this year. So just keep that in mind. Let's go to the next play here. Again, in this particular play, you're going to see the Seattle Seahawks offense is in the gun. Three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back. Again, this is a play action play. There's a reason why I'm going to keep showing you guys this. When the play is snapped, the Seattle Seahawks are going to be playing what is known as max protection. What max, max protection pretty much means is that everybody that can stay back to protect the quarterback is going to stay back except the wide receivers, and that is exactly what happens. The only players that leave are the wide receivers. Everybody else is staying to protect Geno Smith, the tight ends, the running backs, everything. Now again, what you're going to see here is that the Panthers defense, not playing zone this time, is playing a disguised man coverage. And the reason I know this is this. When you take a look at Jackson Smith, Smith Nigba, who's coming across the formation, nobody moves with him as he's coming across, which is usually a telltale sign that it's going to be a man coverage scheme. But notice what happens as Metcalf is coming across the field and receives the pass. He's covered 1v1. That's also a telltale sign that this is man coverage. So pretty much what it means is that the Panthers' defense disguised that it was a zone coverage when it's actually a man coverage. So what happens? Geno Smith snaps the ball. He's going to go back in there. He's going to give the play, action, uh, the play action motion like he would. And now he has to sit and wait and let this play to develop. He doesn't panic. He doesn't get flustered. He waits. And DK Metcalf comes open over the middle and picks up a 34-yard gain. But I want to show you all this really quickly here. When I, when I say Max Pro for a reason, there is a reason here. Take a look at this still frame. Look at all the people that are in protection of Geno Smith here. This, and the, why do they do this? The reason why is because as you saw with the whole, like, the whole play going through, this is a long developing play. It's going to take time to develop. So you have to keep those guys in there to protect the quarterback so you can allow the play to develop. But again, it's a play action pass. The Lions are good at play action pass. We also know that the Lions offense is really good in 
protecting Jared Goff when they give him some time. So if the Lions are able to take the lessons that the Seahawks are giving here and give extra protection for Jared Goff, they'll be able to allow those deeper shot plays to become available if they just allow a chance to develop and protect Jared Goff. Because what this play is showing is that it's definitely there. Now, that's the second play. Let's move into the third play here. This third play, again, we're going to be going back to the Seattle Seahawks offense in the gun. We have three wide receivers. We have one tight end that kind of looks like he's in the slot, but not really. And we have one running back. Now, what do we have here? Geno Smith is going to snap the ball from the gun. This one is not a play action play. It's a straight drop back. The Panthers are again running a zone coverage. But what you're going to see here on this particular still frame that's coming up here, I'm going to let the play run through for a moment or two, is there's a miscommunication on the responsibility of who has the wide receiver. And when you take a look at the result after the play is run through, it results in a huge freaking play of about nearly 20 yards. Now that the play has had a chance to run through a little bit, take a look at what I'm talking about as far as this miscommunication. What you're going to see is that when the wide receiver, Metcalf, is on the outside doing a corner route, the two guys that are in zone coverage are going to bite down on that shallow outside pattern, and it's going to allow DK Metcalf to get behind the zone coverage and find that soft coverage that's on the backside of that zone, of that, of that zone for the corner route. When you think about it, this is part of the problem with zone coverage. And I've talked about this before. Zone coverage has inherent weaknesses that is that is built into it because the zones can't cover every inch of the field. That's number one. But the other main problem with, with zone coverage is that if the, if the cornerbacks or the defensive backs aren't properly communicating on who has who and what zone, it's going to result in plays like this where two guys are going to bounce or going to freaking, uh, what do I want to, what do I, what, what do I want to mean here? They're going to play on one singular dude and it's going to allow another guy to get behind the coverage and find a soft zone which is going to allow the quarterback and wide receiver to take advantage of it which is exactly what happens in this play so that's play number three let's take a look at this play that's upcoming here too again Seahawks offense gun it's going to be three wide receivers one tight end one running back now in this particular play this is a quick hitter play you're going to see quick slants and hitch routes for the for the freaking Seahawks offense here the Panthers cornerback. I want you all to take a look at this once the play has run through a couple of moments. You're going to see DK Metcalf gets this catch, and it looks pretty easy. Well, it ought to be pretty easy because, one, it's a slant route. Quarterback and wide receivers run this all the dang time. But at the same time, now that the play's had a chance to run through for a moment, I want you all to take a look at this still frame. Look at how much cushion the Panthers cornerback, Dante Jackson, gives DK Metcalf, one of the biggest and most physical wide receivers in the game. He gives five yards of cushion to DK Metcalf off the ball, and he doesn't do anything to try and check him. He doesn't do anything to try and slow his progression. He just literally gives him the yardage off the ball. This is easy pitch and catch. This is easy yardage for a quarterback and wide receiver. Geno Smith makes this very easy throw, and Metcalf not only takes this short slant and catches the ball, but he's then able to pick up 22 yards from this play. I'm sorry, you cannot do that against DK Metcalf. And I'm also going to tell you this right now. While the Lions don't have a physically imposing wide receiver like Metcalf in terms of size, they do have the speed demons. If you do not check our wide receivers off the line as fast as they are, you're already inviting trouble. I'm telling you that right now. Whether it's Jamo, whether it's Khalif Raymond, whether it's Jameer Gibbs, if you don't check those guys, you're going to be paying for it really, really quickly. It's not even a debate. So that's the fourth play right there. Now here's the final play we're going to take a look at. When you take a look at this play, you're again going to see the Seahawks offense is in the gun, but this is going to be a gun empty set. So Geno Smith is back there all alone. There's nobody in the backfield with him. Now let's see what we're, let's see what we're going to see here again. Take a look at the Panthers as the play run through. The Panthers' defense is, again, running a zone defense. Geno snaps the ball, and he's instantaneously looking towards the left side of the field. So what happens? You're going to see tight end Parkinson is running what is known as kind of like a shallow out or a quick out pattern. Well, what happens is that the cornerback that's in play, again, Dante Jackson, he's reading Smith's eyes because, again, one of the things that cornerbacks are taught to do is they're told to watch the quarterback's eyes because that right there can tell you where the ball is going. But in one of the few times that I can think of, the quarterback actually uses his eyes to deceive the cornerback to actually get that cornerback to bite down on the shallow route to allow the deeper route behind him 
to get open. What do I mean by this? As you've seen the play run through, Kenneth Walker, the running back, actually gets behind the zone coverage, sees this huge coverage. And again, I'm going to show you this uh, still frame. There's a huge coverage gap on the backside where freaking all freaking Geno Smith has to do is just dump this ball in a bucket to Kenneth Walker. And Kenneth Walker just has to hope and pray he doesn't drop the pass, which he doesn't. This is, again, a very easy pitch and catch, and it's because of miss communication. And it's also because Geno Smith does a really good job with his eyes to deceive the defense to open up that wheel route for freaking um, Kenneth Walker to get behind the defense. Now I'm telling you this right now. When you take a look at all these plays that I've just shown you all from the Seattle Seahawks game, which the Seattle Seahawks offense is very similar to the Lions offense, I'm going to say this right now. Jared Goff is a better quarterback than Geno Smith. Jared Goff will be able to see what these guys are doing in terms of their zone coverage and be able to exploit that to no end. And again, let's consider this. Yes, the Seattle Seahawks, they have Tyler Lockett. They have Jackson Smith-Nigba. They have Noah Fant. They have Kenneth Walker. They have Zach Charbonnet. They have DK Metcalf. Wait a minute. Where have I heard their story before? Oh, that's right. The Lions, they have Jamison Williams. They have Alan Ross St. Brown. They have Josh Reynolds. They have Khalif Raymond. They have Sam Laporta. They have Jameer Gibbs. They have David Montgomery. You're talking about two offenses that they have, they have a literal bevy of weapons that is going up against a defense in the Panthers that is already missing a lot of guys due to injury. And again, what's the one difference between the Seahawks and the Lions in terms of their offenses? The Lions' offensive line is substantially better than the Seahawks' offensive line. But again, Take a look at it from this perspective. The Seahawks were at home. The Lions are going to be at home. The Lions play better at home. This is a proven fact. Jared Goff plays better at home. All of this is, in my opinion, leading a further conclusion that I think the Panthers are in very big trouble, whether it's on offense or on defense. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Panthers' offense is very weak. It's very inexperienced. And you guys are going to see that in my later episode today when I talk about it. But when you take a look at the Lions' offense going against this Panthers' defense, this Lions' offense literally can take the lessons that I'm showing from film and other lessons that they can learn from other places in film and just take advantage of it. There's there's literal tons of stuff to exploit here. So for me, it's like, I can't see any reason why the Lions offense cannot do very, very well against the Panthers defense, especially when you take a look at the film study that I presented and when you take a look at the statistical breakdown that I showed in yesterday's episode, which I'll put back up at the top right here. My whole point is this. When you take a look at everything that I'm trying to present here, it makes total sense why the Lions are almost nine-point favorites in freaking Sunday's game. Now, I suspect that as time goes by, that's going to come down a little bit. But it's like, listen, there's a reason why Vegas is expecting the Lions to win by a wide margin, and it's not even particularly close, especially when you take a look at the evidence that I presented. But anyway, I'd like to hear what you guys think. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hear some disgruntled Panthers fans. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hear some Lions fans tell me to slow, slow down a little bit, not get too cocky, but my whole point is this. I present the evidence. You may not like the evidence, but again, it is the evidence. But without further ado, I think I've done a good job of presenting said evidence. So I'm going to say thank you all for watching yet another episode of MCM, Motor City Mania. If by chance you like what you saw, by all means, I highly encourage you all to do one of these three things. Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If by chance you subscribed in the past and you forgot to do so at the time, or you just subscribed and you've not yet had a chance to do so, I highly encourage y'all, please make sure you turn on that bell notification icon at the bottom of the page, so that way you never miss any more content that I push out. Again, we're getting that subscriber count up, but let's keep it up. Let's keep getting it up even further, and let's make sure we turn that bell notification icon on, so that way you always are in the know-how and you always get the most latest up-to-date Lions content that I have to provide. And I also encourage y'all, please, share this content with your Lions friends and family members and share anywhere and everywhere you can with everybody and anybody you can. Share it here on YouTube, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook. It always helps. Let's continue to spread the word about the channel and get more people in to have, greater, to have better conversations and better discussions about our Detroit Lions. And with that being said, folks, this is MCM signing off for now. And until the next time we meet, I just want to say thank you all for your view. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all for your patronage. God bless. And I'll see you all in the next episode.